Hi, I'm Pastor Goodman. And this is the Lord who God's life. Okay, so plot twist. I was thinking about baptism the other day. That's weird, right? <laughs> Isn't it weird that just like in the waters of baptism, God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden and then clothed them by sacrificing an animal, covering them so that they could see each other without shame by wearing something given by God. Isn't it weird that water cleansed evil from the world even as God preserved faithful Noah and his family through it? Isn't it weird that God saved his people by joining them together with Joseph, who had gone down into the pit and was raised back up out of it to save them from famine when they were reunited with him even after sin had driven them apart? Isn't it weird that Moses led his people out of death and into life in a promised land through the, cro the crossing of water in the Red Sea? Isn't it weird that Naaman was told to wash seven times in the Jordan River to be cleansed from leprosy? Isn't it weird that Jonah spent three days in a watery grave deep within the belly of the fish only to be spit back out to speak in peace to an entire nation of sinners that they would not die but they would live? It just sounds kind of familiar. These stories, over and over and over again, the tying of a people to the sacrificial death and resurrection that by death and water and life raised from it, God would save his people. He sure uses imagery a lot. That in the identity that God would bestow on his people, the washing in the blood of the lamb that clothes us in white robes, that we would be brought through the great tribulation to stand before the throne in the lamb and his kingdom on that last great day when we are raised in our bodies, isn't it vaguely familiar? It's almost like all of scripture keeps giving us the same story. It's almost like God keeps these images showing up on purpose. It's almost like he's using all of these things to teach us that these things were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and by believing you may have life in his name, which is the same name, the triune name, that you were given in the waters of your baptism. Man, this stuff just keeps popping up. Sometimes I wonder if we don't just miss the forest for the trees. So, when it comes to baptism, and I found out just how hung up some people are on the whole submersion thing, not just that a little bit of water be splashed on you while the word of God is spoken in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, but that you actually have to be submerged like all the way under the water. Um, I actually thought that was kind of cool. I mean, awesome. What a great image. The, the drowning of the old Adam and the raising up of the new man. Look at what that points to, that we are united with Jesus in his death and resurrection. But the thing is, I got to talking with some of the people who were so hung up on the fact that you had to be immersed in water for it to actually be a valid baptism. But the thing is, they wouldn't go so far as to say that it did anything. They had a beautiful image, but they lost what it pointed to. I mean, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? We were buried with Jesus by baptism into death in order that just as he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. I mean, if we've been united with him in a death like his, shouldn't we certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his? At least according to Romans. It's easy when it comes to all of the beauty of, of the story of the scripture, all of the beauty, even of the, the ceremonies that come with the, the mandated rites that God would have us do, the, the, the joyful parts of the ceremony of baptism, um, sometimes we miss what all of it's teaching in the first place. This is something that Luther grabs hold of in the large catechism. He writes, Lastly, we must also know what baptism signifies and why God has ordained just such external sign and ceremony for the sacrament by which we are first received into the Christian church. But the act or ceremony is this, that we are sunk under the water, which passes over us, and afterwards are drawn out again. These two parts, to be sunk under the water and drown out again, signify the power and operation of baptism, which is nothing else than putting to death the old Adam, and after that, the resurrection of the new man, both of which must take place in us, in our lives, so that a truly Christian life is nothing else than a daily baptism, once begun, and ever to be continued, for this must be practiced without ceasing. When we miss the beauty of what all of these stories, all of these images, all of this 
gift that God would give us is pointing to, well, what's next after you're baptized but to behave? See, all of Scripture is painting a picture of what God would give you in your baptism, not just once, but over and over again every day for the rest of your life. Even Moses and the people were baptized into the cloud and into the sea. And don't miss what the Red Sea and the garments of skin given to Adam and Eve and, and the ark that Noah rode in and the water that Naaman washed in the union to Joseph's being raised out of the pit and the life that came through the sign of Jonah and the water that would give it all to you are the exact same thing. God's ever-abounding grace and mercy, not because you pledged the right way by jumping into the deep end of the pool, not the shallow end. Not because you have somehow learned a magic spell to make God be nice to you that one time. And you just need to, you know, try. But because God actually loves you so much that he would send forth his son Jesus Christ to die upon the cross, rise from the dead, and sends forth his Holy Spirit in word and in sacrament to give you a gift that endures where so much else in this world would fall apart. All of it stands on God's holy word. All of it works God's holy will. I mean, couches were baptized. To, to be baptized just means to wash. Yes, with water, but the thing that makes baptism so incredibly special is the word of God that would speak life everlasting to you. Life everlasting that is not dependent on you being nice or good or charitable, but but on God being merciful, and that does not run out. That happens every single day for the rest of our lives. Baptism is nothing other than a seal that God would give you to wear every single day for the rest of your whole entire life that you would always know who you are. You are a child of God. You are somebody that Jesus has mercy on. You are somebody who stands under the shelter and, and blood of the cross that you might be united to him in his resurrection. This story shows up throughout the whole life of the scriptures and it's given for every day of your life too, not just as a one-time pledge, but as a life-giving water, rich in grace and a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit. It is a daily drowning of the old Adam and a daily raising up of the new man. It is a unity with Christ that he would have go forward in time until the very last great day of the resurrection of all flesh so that you would not be on your own in this mess. And all of the imagery is beautiful. But don't lose sight of the fact that God actually wants you to have more than something nice to think about. He gives you the same gift in your baptism that you would be tied alongside the saints of old to the Lord who saves all and who works all for good, that every day of your life you would be dragged just a little bit closer to glory, that on that last great day you might finally see what it has all been doing all along. But in all of it, God was at work. He was at work from Adam and Eve to you unto the very last day, when we who are baptized into the blood of the Lamb, into the water and word of God, might stand before the Lamb in his kingdom clothed in white robes with palm branches in our hands. Be at peace. Your baptism has saved you.